And to our next session, which is about practice and good, uh, uh, good practice. Um, I'd like to introduce Steve to you, Steve Hardy, and he's a consultant nurse in learning disabilities at Oxley's NHS Foundation Trust and also an honorary lecturer for the Institute of Psychiatry and he will be talking to us about uh, mental capacity. Thank you very much Steve. Thank you and uh, thanks to uh, Sean and the team for inviting me. I shall do my best to try and talk in my uh, posh phone voice and not my uh, South East London twang. Uh, just to say uh, I used to work in uh, Camberwell at the Institute of Psychiatry. I still have uh, a part-time uh, position with them. Uh, I feel that I can say this, but that is the only tree in Camberwell. It isn't. If you're going through South East London, drive straight through. I now work in uh, Sidcup, uh, where we have lots and lots of trees, and we get to mix with the uh, posh folk. Okay. So, I will mention Scotland in a minute, but what I'm really going to be talking about is mental capacity in general. How it relates to people with learning disabilities, uh, how we assess capacity and then how we make best interest decisions. So the actual process I'm going to go through will be based on English and Welsh law. So I've got my phone in front of me to keep to time and uh, I've just been mentioned by someone on Twitter. I should turn that off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it applies to all adults in England and Wales over the age of 16. If you work in Scotland, you were far ahead of us and you had the uh, Working with Adults with Mental Incapacity Act for about five, six years uh, before. Uh, and Scotland probably has a, a better process, especially when it comes to uh, best interests. It's far more well-defined uh, than English and Welsh law. But the case studies I'm going to go through precede both Scottish and uh, English and Welsh law. Uh, in Northern Ireland, they're currently looking at, well, probably towards the end of the process of having a joint mental health and mental capacity uh, piece of legislation. But as I said, the case studies I'm going to present, uh, or case law, predates all legislation in the UK, so they have been used in developing uh, Scottish, English and Welsh and Northern Irish uh, uh, legislation. So, very, very quickly, uh, teaching your grandma to suck eggs, mental capacity is your ability to make a, a decision. So it ranges from day-to-day -day small decisions to wider uh, life-changing significant decisions which may have a, a, a legal impact. Why should we follow mental capacity legislation across the UK? Obviously it impacts on a large number of people using our services and therefore on those who provide them, commission them and inspect them. Uh, it's not a choice, this is the most important bit. You know, it's a statutory requirement. We can't choose to opt in or opt out. Uh, following the mental capacity legislation in whichever country you're based mm -hmm. is a valid basis to defence against any litigation if you have uh, followed it appropriately. A really important aspect for our client group, it promotes autonomy and choice and offers protection for people who are vulnerable. Uh, and also, for, especially for people with learning disabilities, and you'll see this in one of the pieces of case law, it hopefully ensures that people with learning disabilities are offered the same uh, range of interventions as those without. And we as practitioners and services need to demonstrate that we followed the principles. So this really is the uh, bit to do with uh, England and Wales, but in the UK, uh, in England and Wales, sorry, we have five underlying principles. Well, so we assume that people have the ability to make their own decisions, and if we're saying they can't, we need to be able to prove it. Uh, and if you're going to say that someone can't make their own decisions, you need to prove that you showed them, gave them enough time, information, which is appropriate to the level of understanding in order to help them come to their own decision. Uh, people, you know, if you've got teenagers here, uh, sons or daughters, 16, 17, 18, or back thinking about when you were younger, or even now, you know, I still totally regret taking that credit card out years ago, but, you know, my mum told me it was an unwise decision, but I still went ahead with it. So people can make decisions which others consider unwise or eccentric, but we will come back to that point a bit later on because it's often misunderstood. Anything we do for someone that's assessed as lacking capacity must be done so in their best interests. And whatever decision we make must be the least restrictive or less restrictive option. Now, it doesn't mean you can't choose a more restrictive option, but you need to show why 
and the reasons why you didn't choose the other options or that you have actually implemented them. So reasons why we might actually question someone's capacity. First of all, they have to have a mental disorder. Uh, so learning disabilities is on that list. Uh, brain injury, stroke, uh, mental health problems, uh, confusion, drowsiness or unconsciousness because of treatment or illness, uh, and substance misuse. I don't think I've left out any, may well have done. Uh, people who have made several unwise decisions. This is probably contradicts the third principle of the Mental Capacity Act. If you're working with someone who's making a series of unwise decisions, you know, I'd really look at the quality and of the mental capacity assessments. I'm not saying that person lacks capacity. People, you know, like my credit card, I don't have to learn from my mistakes. I can continue to take, it, take out that credit card and, and use it down the high street. But if someone's making ser several unwise decisions, they have a mental disorder, you need to consider, is there something about that person's mental disorder which is, you know, impacting on this decision? Uh, we know that many people with learning disabilities may be easily suggestible, they may acquiesce or could be co coerced, so we need to check that out. And your personal knowledge of the individual. So common scenarios for us, uh, one of the main ones I come across with medical treatment, for social workers, where to live, contact with family, others, managing money. Uh, though not covered by mental capacity legislation in England and Wales, I'm not too sure about Scotland. Sexual relationships is often one we're asked to assess. Uh, and in England and Wales, that will come under the uh, Sexual Offences Act. Uh, there's good guidance from the uh, BMA on how to assess capacity for sexual relationships. And a very common one recently, engaging in a tenancy agreement with a large amount of people moving from supported living into residential care. It's a large part of care managing social work duty at the moment. So it should be decision specific. You know, a person, you can lack capacity to make one or two, three, four decisions, but then have the capacity to make a lot of others. And I don't want to cast dispersions any of you fine people here, but how many of you go into the conference party tonight? A few? Okay. Well, watch out for them later on, because they may well lack capacity come midnight. Uh, this time tomorrow, they may well have regained it. Okay, so capacity can fluctuate, it can be temporary, it can change, uh, it can be partial. Uh, so especially if you're working with people with learning disabilities, if you're giving them more information, they may well regain capacity. Working with people early middle stages of dementia, especially people abusing alcohol, drugs, etc., it can change. So who assesses capacity? Now, this is a, an issue we're having locally where I work in uh, my particular borough. Uh, you know, people misunderstanding who should actually uh, carry out assessments, and we have had a few nurses carry out assessments and make decisions uh, where the doctor has found to. So the person who normally assesses capacity is the one that would implement it if the person has capacity and agrees. So the example there, i.e. if it's surgery, the surgeon and so on. But it would be best practice to involve those with experience in working with people with, that, with learning disabilities or that particular person and their family. Uh, Enhancing capacity, obviously we have a, a responsibility to do this, and I think we do this very well in services for people with learning disability. And we need to demonstrate, if any of our capacity assessments were questioned, we need to demonstrate that we took all reasonable efforts to ensure that we enhance capacity. Outdated approaches. Now you may well still find this, and if you read some of the CQC reports, or some of the reports being uh, evidence given to the House of, Committee, House of Lords Scrutiny Committee, which is happening at the moment, uh, the status approach often been applied to people with learning disabilities. Looks like over half the people in this room up until 1918, just based on your gender, you lack the capacity to decide who would govern this country. Uh, and it's often been applied and often still is applied to people with learning disabilities. The other one is the outcome approach based on values. Okay. I'll give you an example, practical example. I was giving a talk like this at, uh, at Guy's Hospital, one of the doctors there, with all goodwill and intentions, uh, said that if he was assessing the capacity of someone with a severe learning disability, he would probably lower the pass mark, lower the threshold. Mm -hmm. I'll move that, another Twitter. Oh, that's Michelle, LD staff nurse, thank you. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, 
So he was suggesting he would lower the threshold, the pass mark, for where capacity, we would have capacity or not. I argued that, well, I think that, that scenario that you're going to lower that threshold uh, is because you want that person, you agree with the decision. Now I said to him, if it was the, perhaps a decision where that woman with uh, moderate learning ability, and the question was whether she had the capacity to enter a sexual relationship, would you then still lower the threshold? And he said no. So his uh, approach was based on values. Because it doesn't matter if you have a learning ability, a mental health problem, or dementia, the pass mark for a capacity assessment should always be the same, uh, regardless of your level of ability. Where it changes is the enhancing, the information you give to the person, the time you take to give to them that the pass mark should always be the same. Now, there's two pieces of key legislation which have helped develop capacity uh, law across the UK. This is quite a famous one, and you may well have heard of it before. Rhys C was a man in uh, a high secure hospital, uh, being treated, I think, for schizophrenia uh, under uh, uh, Section 3741. Uh, fortunately for him, he developed a gangrenous foot uh, the recommended treatment at that time from the treating surgeon was uh, uh, amputation. Uh, the gentleman disagreed and it went to court. Uh, there was a high risk of him uh, dying without having the operation, but there were alternative uh, methods of treatment. They found, after him being assessed by uh, a number of people, that he was under able to understand and retain the information which was given to him, and he was able to use and weigh it in coming to a decision and they ruled that he had uh, capacity. He didn't die, and he, didn't, he, and he retained his foot. Uh, the second case is more recent. MB, a uh, pregnant woman, uh, she's agreed uh, to have a cesarean section and all the uh, uh, treatment that goes with it. However, she actually gets to the point where the operation's about to happen, uh, and she starts to scream, shout, and refuses and changes her mind. Uh, it goes to uh, the court uh, very, very quickly. The court will now, the court of protection uh, can hear you within an hour or so. Uh, they found that she had a phobia of needles, and due to that phobia of needles, it clouded her judgment. She was not able to weigh up and use the information relating to this decision. Most importantly was the fact that A, she might die, B, she's likely to lose uh, the child, and then also the impact of that on her relationship as well. Uh, so they ruled that she lacked capacity because she was unable to comprehend and remember the information material to that decision, especially the consequences of uh, saying no. So this has then led to, in England and Wales, what we call the functional test. It's a four-stage test for assessing capacity, and the individual needs, needs to pass all four stages. So you can see that this relates to the previous case law, which uh, set precedence. They need to understand the information you're giving them. They need to remember it long enough to make that decision. And this is the really important one where people with learning disabilities tend to fall down on. They need to demonstrate that they've used and weighed that information uh, when coming to their decision. And they need to communicate it whichever way they communicate. So a couple of more practical examples. For medical treatment, this is some extra guidance from the uh, BMA. They just need to understand in simple language what the treatment is, its nature, purpose, why it's being proposed. They need to understand the principal benefits, risks and alternatives. And for people with learning disabilities especially, they need to understand that they can say no and also that they can stop the treatment at any time. Uh, they're really important for often people don't realise that they can say no uh, and stop the treatment. So those questions need to be asked in your assessment. They need to understand in broad terms what the consequences of saying no will be. They need to remember the information long enough to come to a decision. So some examples of questions. Uh, they need to give information. So we may need to translate it back from the doctor. You could start with a very broad question. Can you tell me about the treatment? You never know, you might get everything you need back, but then you might start to need to probe a bit further. So what are the good things about having this treatment? Possible answers, it make the cancer go away and make me better. What are the bad things? Well, it's not going to work. I feel very sick. What well, if you don't have the treatment? I won't get better. I might die. Uh, what do you want to do? So that's communicating the choice. And then the big question, what are the reasons? Why are you saying yes? Why are you saying no? Tenancy agreement. 
a big one for social workers at the moment, but I'm sure if you work in community learning with your teams, you may be uh, helping and advising on this. It's the information you might give to the person. You're going to be living here, you're going to have to pay rent. That means you have to pay this amount every time this month. You're going to have to pay for food, electricity, etc. Electricity is what makes the, makes the lights work. The more electricity you use, the more you have to pay. You have to take care of the house. Yeah, that means you have to make sure you look after things. If you don't pay the rent, you don't pay the electricity, you might not be able to live here anymore. And it goes on, the information you might give them. So the questions you might ask, I've said you will be paying money. Can you tell me how much you're going to be paying? When do you have to pay it? What else do you have to pay for? What happens if you don't pay? What happens if you cause a lot of trouble? So, you know, basically breaking down the information that you've given them and then asking questions around that. This is the most important slide I'll probably show. Assessing capacity is a conversation, it's not an exam. Then we talk about functional tests and passing all four stages. You know, so it's about talking to the person as an informal way as possible, making them feel at ease, enhancing capacity. Uh, this is where sometimes people have problems. There's no prescribed amount of knowledge. Uh, if you look at the code of practice, it doesn't tell you exactly what someone needs to know. You don't, you can't, I think some of the problems people have, you can't get a passe checklist, you can't get an aberrant behaviour scale to actually give you a threshold. Over 40, this person has capacity, under they don't. It's based on the balance of probability and clinical judgement. So, models of decision making. Obviously, you can make your own decision. And if you have a capacity, that has to be respected. If you have capacity, you can make an advanced decision in terms of uh, medical treatment to refuse uh, treatment. You can't demand it. In the USA, they use uh, substituted judgment. You know, what would I do standing in that other person's shoes? There's a lot of research that's been done on this approach. Uh, and one of the major ones which criticises this approach, uh, they took a large group of uh, individuals who had capacity asked them to choose their substituted judgment maker. Obviously, normally someone they feel they trust, someone very close to, separated them, gave them both a similar set of uh, scenarios, and there was only 75% of agreement between the two groups. And some of the uh, scenarios you know, involve very serious decisions about end of life care, treatment, etc. So in the UK, it's hopefully a more objective test it's best interest, what's the best course of action for this person at this particular time, and not the personal views of the decision maker. Now, three, uh, three cases uh, which have helped shape uh, capacity law. Re A, this is very interesting, in fact, because one went through uh, the courts in August, which was the opposite outcome to this. Uh, Re A, A is a man with Down syndrome and learning disabilities. I think he was approaching middle age, lives with mum who's older. He goes to a day service uh, and she's come home and said to his mum he wants a girlfriend. In my opinion, she's totally overreacted and she's taken him to a clinic to be sterilised. He, uh, obviously the doctor's refused. Uh, she's gone to court to get a lawful decision uh, that he can be sterilised. It's only gone to court because he lacks capacity. So this is, starts to show you how best interest uh, decisions should be made. Uh, so the advantages of a vasectomy were not clear. They asked, would his freedom be restricted if he retained his fertility? So could he have closer supervision at the day centre? It's unlikely to reduce uh, risk of exploitation, sexually transmitted infections. He was unlikely to engage in a casual sexual relationship. A very important question that you start to see in case law in the 90s onwards, would it improve the person's quality of life? Often decisions prior to this in courts were often very uh, heavily laid on the medical perspective. The impact on his mother or any woman who might get pregnant is irrelevant as mum would continue to care for him. Do you never consider uh, how it affects somebody else in a best interest decision unless it impacts directly back on the individual? And we've got an example of that in a minute. Uh, if he did have a child, uh, the disapproval of his conduct is unlikely to impinge on him. Uh, there's less restrictive options. Uh, they also considered this, this benefit, risks, discomfort of the operation, and they said no. However, in August, there's a, court, a case went through the Court of Protection. 
uh, a gentleman that lacked capacity and they ruled in favour. It was in his best interest for him to have uh, a false sterilisation. Uh, I'll uh, give Sean my uh, email address and if anybody wants any further information on that case, it's very interesting, you can uh, email me. Uh, this is a very important one, the second one. S is a young man with profound learning abilities, an NHS trust. Uh, he unfortunately has chronic kidney failure. He, uh, the best course of treatment recommended for him at this time is a kidney transplant. However, the NHS Trust feel that he won't be able to understand the operation, follow the aftercare arrangements, and they've gone to court to get a lawful decision to say they can withhold a kidney transplant. This is a really important statement for our client group. So just because a person cannot understand treatment does not mean they cannot have it. The inability to understand must make the treatment intolerable. If there's a quality of life, then even if necessary to go through a traumatic period, it will be worthwhile in the long term. Uh, the court sought uh, specialist advice, uh, and they thought that with specialist preparation, a lot of the problems that the NHS Trust was stating could be overcome. Uh, and they said no. It was not lawful to withhold a kidney transplant on non-medical grounds. This is a re another really interesting one, which shows you how you only consider the impact on other people if it impacts directly back on the person. Uh, why? Uh, lives in a supported house, uh, but she has a close relationship with mum and sister who live locally. Uh, sister has kids who also the sister has a uh, close relationship with. Why is a woman with learning abilities? Uh, unfortunately, Y's sister uh, has some form of uh, leukaemia and requires a bone marrow transplant. Through previous uh, investigations, they know that Y is a match. She lacks capacity. Uh, it's gone to court to ask if it's lawful for Y to uh, have her bone marrow harvested uh, for her sister. So what they weighed up when looking at the best interests, she would continue to enjoy visits from her mother and sister if it went ahead. Uh, she did have a good relationship with mum and sister. If sister becomes unwell, visits from mum would reduce. Strong possibility without this transplant, sister would die, uh, and thus visits then from her would reduce. Uh, sister's more likely to recover with wise bone marrow, though sister's best interests, as we said, are not the issue. Survival of her sister is in wise best interests. Operation would be traumatic and comfortable. She's starting to look at the dis, dis benefits. Uh, we know that she's had two general anaesthetics in the past and she's at no greater risk than the rest of the population. She could be supported through it, uh, she could have painkillers, and they said yes. So what we start to see here from looking at those three cases and the wider range of cases that have gone through uh, courts is a balance sheet approach. And this is recommended if you're making a best interest decision yourself or in a best interest meeting. On that balance sheet, you need to look at the benefits, the disbenefits, possible gains and losses, and likelihood of harm occurring. You need to strike a balance between the two, and only if the benefits outweigh the disbenefits should the procedure or decision be viewed as in the person's best interests. And this is the approach they recommend. As you can see from those three cases, you know, they, as well as looking at medical uh, perspective, they looked at the emotional well-being of the person and the social welfare of the person, and you look at the possible advantages and disadvantages. For England and Wales, uh, and as I said, it's probably more firmer in, in, in Scotland, uh, we do have an, uh, what we call a statutory checklist, and I'm surprised when they go around services because the, uh, the, the clue is in the title, statutory checklist. Uh, if you're making any best interest decision, whether it be yourself or in a best interest meeting, and often doctors don't, are not even aware of this, is that you should be using uh, this checklist. And if it was ever questioned, you need to demonstrate you've used it. And it should be clearly written within uh, or in your medical notes, etc. So basically, it asks you to consider, are you making your decision based on the person's age, what they look like, uh, any aspects of their behaviour or any condition they have. So that's to move away from the, the status approach. You've got a learning disability, you can't make that decision. You know, if it's not an urgent decision, you need to consider, can this person, is it likely they're going to regain capacity? You know, so with extra support from speech and language therapy, more time, could the person regain capacity? 
you still need to encourage them to get involved. Uh, you need to consult others, which is really important. That's one of the major criticisms uh, involving families. Uh, and you need to consider all the relevant circumstances. Uh, we've mentioned them in those cases. Last two slides. This sounds so obvious, but I'm sure from your own practice you might have come across this. Please, please, before a best interest decision is made, just check that an assessment of capacity has been completed. And it was actually concluded uh, that that person lacked capacity. I was at, uh, I heard, I wasn't at, I heard of a best interest decision locally, not in my local area, where they had a best interest meeting to decide whether to resuscitate someone or not. And no one had done a uh, assessment. Uh, okay, last slide really, there are some decisions you cannot make, uh, and these are very, very personal ones. So not, even, not us can make, not even a judge or a court. Marriage, civil partnership, sexual relationships, divorce, adoption, uh, discharging parental responsibilities. So key points then, mental capacity legislation is everybody's business. It's a clear framework, whichever country you're in, promotes autonomy and, and gives you advice and a process to follow on how to make best interest decisions. However, it does not provide a tick box threshold assessment. There's no pass out checklist. As clinicians, we need to be making these decisions. And families and carers should always be a central part of the mental capacity process and should be not be overlooked. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise, Steve. That, again, was absolutely fascinating and illustrates, I think, the ethical complexity of learning disability practice and uh, and the rights-based approach so um